So I'll see here, this is a video lesson for Python programming, clocks. And by clocks, we mean the ones that measure time. So we're going to learn how to include clocks and time in our programs. And we're going to learn in this lesson how to affect the animation of something based on real world time rather than on how fast our CPU is capable of processing our frame group. I've started this code with stub two. I've added several lines of code to prepare for this lesson that are not a part of stub two. I've added the class bouncer to create two instances of what the user will see as a circle on the screen that bounces back and forth. The bouncer class uh, has attributes color, size, x and y position, direction, and speed. I've also included a dictionary called bag and I've put two instances of the bouncer class. I've made two instances, one with key red, one with key blue, which I'm also using as their colors. In the frame loop, I've made a algorithm for moving these two instances. I'm, I have an algorithm that is independent for each one, but right now it's the same process because I'm going to change one of them when I introduce time into my program so that we can compare. But these movement algorithms, first check the attribute of direction and it adds to the x position of the object if it's moving right, it subtracts from the x position if it's moving left. The amount that it adds and subtracts is the attribute speed. So it's worth noting that the speed attribute is being added or subtracted uh, from the position once per frame. And both of these algorithms are identical for the moment. I also have an algorithm for detecting collision, which means the position um, close to the edges of the screen. So at some point it will bounce and head in the other direction and then bounce back to keep the movement of these objects on the screen. I also have a simple algorithm to draw them as circles and I have used a font to render a string which will show us as text the number of frames, uh, the count of frames that are going by that is going to rise as the program runs. Let's take a look at what we're starting with. We can see that we have the frame count. It's counting up. The speed at which the, frame, the number of frames is going up is an indication of how fast our CPU is processing our frame loop. This computer is doing it quite quickly. I have the two bouncer instances drawn as circles, bouncing back and forth, and they're bouncing uh, in sync because their movement algorithms are the same. Let's add to this. We're going to base the, the animation of the blue ball or blue circle on real world time. To do that, we need to introduce real world time into our code. I've already done that with, under the comment, create a clock. I've created an instance of what Pygame calls a clock. And I have given the variable watch to represent that instance. So now in my program, I can use this variable watch to help me find uh, the real world time. So I created my clock before my while loop started, my frame loop. And now in the frame loop, under a comment at the very beginning, I'm going to account for time. Here is the most fundamental way of accounting for time. On the instance of my clock that I call watch, I use the tick function. The tick function returns the number of milliseconds that have passed since the last call to the tick function. That means if, that if we put the watch.tick calling the tick function on our clock instance that we've called watch right here, 
if I put that line of code at the top of each frame and I only put that line of code once, I only use the tick function on this watch once, then that means that the next time I call that function, it will be, it will represent, it will find the number of milliseconds that it took to process the rest of the last frame. If I do this every single frame right at the top, then what I'm finding is the number of milliseconds, which is a measure of real world time that it took to always process the last frame. So I can use the speed at which my frames are processing in order to guide how much I need to change, in this case, the position of the things I want to move or animate. Now, I need to remember how much time has passed. I need to remember this value that tick produces or returns by setting it equal to the variable, and I've chose the variable timing. I can observe the value of timing right away by printing it. On the left, I see numbers that are going so fast they're hard to read. But if I look at them, I can see that there's many fours, fives, and some sixes, and I believe that I saw a 10 go by once or twice. Maybe some threes. Those numbers are the number of milliseconds that it took to process the, from, from the last time that the tick function was called. So it is the amount of time that's passing to make our frames. Now those numbers aren't consistent. They are an average around four on the lot of threes in there because it never takes exactly the same amount of time to process each frame or iterate through the while loop. Notice that the speed of, of our balls that are bouncing back and forth has slowed down greatly. The reason why that slowed down is because right now the position is changing by a fixed amount each frame. It's taking longer to process the frames than it did the last time I ran this program. That means that I'm adding that speed amount less often and so it's going more slowly. The reason why it's taking longer to process these frames is because I've added more code to the frame loop, but not that much more code, only these two lines. It's the print that really slows things down, really slows things down. We don't want to use the uh, print function inside graphics of a while loop or frame loop processing. Um, we want to avoid it unless we're checking something. I'm going to take that line of code out. And I'm going to consider how I can change the algorithm of the movement of blue to base it on real world time. Thankfully, the math is very simple. Instead of adding or subtracting the speed value each frame, I'm going to add or subtract the speed times this timing variable. I'm going to multiply the speed by the number of milliseconds it took to compose the last frame. <clears throat> that means that if timing is an integer, then things ought to be moving much more quickly if I'm multiplying the speed by an integer compare it with the other one, I'm just adding the speed once each frame. Now I'm adding that speed for the blue ball once times the number of milliseconds from the last frame, the value of timing. So I should expect the blue ball to move more quickly, if not much more quickly. Let's see what happens. That's not the case. But it's not the case for maybe a reason that we might not expect unless we see what's happening with the value of timing right now. We observed the value of timing when we printed it. We saw lots of threes and fours and fives. So 
the blue ball, if we're multiplying those by those threes, fours, and fives, should be should be moving three, four, or five times faster, but it's not. Remember, the print of that number slowed things down. It slowed things down significantly. So by taking it out, we greatly affected this value of timing. And in fact, sometimes the value of timing can be zero. That's because watch.tick can't go be any finer in detecting or more accurate in detecting how much time is passing, but to round it to the nearest millisecond, one thousandth of a second. If our frame loop takes less than one millisecond, the value of timing can be zero and often is. So we're the blue ball is slower than the red because for many frames, the value of timing is in fact zero and we're multiplying by zero and therefore in many frames, not adding anything at all to the position. Let's get a little closer understanding of this by calculating frames per second. FPS, this concept of how many times you iterate in one second of real world time. Well, we have our value of timing. How can we do the math to turn it into frames per second? We're going to create a variable called frames per second. Very often the variable, if it's used in programs, and it very often is, can just be a capital FPS. But for now, that big variable to describe what it represents. And how do we calculate it? Well, here's the reasoning behind the calculation. Imagine that timing is 100. That means that there were 100 milliseconds that went by to process the last frame before we got to this tick function again. 100 milliseconds is one-tenth of a second. So if we had processing that took one-tenth of a second to create a frame, how many frames would that be in one second of time? That would be 10 frames. One frame per tenth of a second means 10 frames per second. So we understand how we can calculate in simple terms, but what happens when timing is a variable that changes? That calculation is very simple. We take the number of milliseconds in one second, that's a thousand, and we divide it by timing to get how many uh, frames we're getting in one second of time. Again, if timing was 100 milliseconds, we'd expect there to be 10 frames per second. And indeed, 1,000 divided by 100 gives us the 10 that we'd expect. We've calculated frames per second. Let's see what happens if we run our code. It breaks. Is there something wrong with the calculation? Well, yes, because we can't divide by zero. Why are we dividing by zero? Because we're getting evidence that sometimes the value of timing is zero. This computer is processing the frames quickly, very quickly. In fact, too quickly to use timing directly. So there's one way around this. We could simply put on condition, and we need to, if timing is equal to zero, there's a problem using it for motion because we'd be multiplying by zero and there's a problem in the frames per second calculation, then set timing equal to one. A very fast frame at least has a minimum time to uh, compose it of one millisecond. And we avoid the division by zero error. Now let's check out our animation that's based on timing. Will the blue ball move faster than the red? Yes. And it does seem to be moving faster and getting farther and farther ahead of the red. It no longer sometimes multiplies by zero to slow it down. Okay. The motion of the 
balls is different. One is based on real world time, that's the blue, and one is based on just as fast as the CPU can process. So our speed attribute now means something differently. The reason why multiplying by time bases the motion on real world time can be captured maybe with this simple concept. If you have a low value for timing, it means that your CPU is processing very quickly. Very quick processing means that you run the tick function, you execute or call the tick function more often, so there's less time in between each call to tick. Lower value for timing. If you have a lower value for timing, you're multiplying and moving, um, you're getting the amount that you add or subtract from the position to be a lower number. Lower value of timing, lower value of the product of the two. So you're adding each frame a smaller amount. Now, if the value of timing is large, it means that the frames are processing more slowly. If you have a slow processing frame, it takes longer to get back to that call to tick, which produces a higher value for timing. If you have a higher value for timing and you're multiplying by speed, you're getting a greater value for the product. Uh, product. So each frame, you're moving your object by a larger amount. Now, this is the way that it needs to be. In order to have different systems move at the appropriate amount, S faster systems will move smaller amounts more often. Slower systems will move larger amounts less often. And this math makes it proportional to how fast you're processing. So basing it on motion or the change in position on real world time will make all systems move at the same rate. Or, to the user's perspective, the motion will be consistent. Now we can introduce a, an algorithm to our program in order to observe that. We can simulate computers that process quickly and process more slowly by slowing down the processing of the frame loops with a process that we can introduce. To do that, we're going to introduce a Boolean called tax CPU. And the Boolean value will be false to start. I'm also going to create a couple of variables called tax counter. and cat tax counter set. And we'll set that value to 2,000. Here's what happens if the Boolean for taxed CPU is true. We check each frame if the value is true. If it is, then we, tap, we subtract from the tax counter timing. And if the tax counter is ever less than or equal to zero, then the taxed CPU will equal false. Otherwise, print the tax counter. So here's what we have set up so far. 
we're creating an algorithm that will tax the CPU, meaning an algorithm that will process simply for the sake of having the CPU something to process, which will then slow down our frame rate. It'll take longer to process the frames, which then are going to affect the motion that we've got set up in two different ways. So what we have here in the account for time is if the tax CPU is happening, if we're actively taxing our CPU with the algorithm that we still have yet to write, then we're going to make this tax counter go down by the real world time. And if the tax counter, which is counting down, ever reaches zero, then we stop taxing our CPU. So this is a way to create a a counter which is going to be set at 2000 we're making use of these two variables if our tax counter is greater than zero then it's effectively counting down and when it gets to zero it turns that boolean false so what turns it true a true taxed cpu boolean means that we're going to process our taxing algorithm And we're going to do that after we move the objects. Under the comment, tax the CPU, and this is a simulation. If it's true, Then we'll make a variable called upper bound equal to a random integer from 50,000 to 100,000. And then start a for loop. from zero to the upper bound that we just found randomly. And in that for loop, we will simply say that x is equal to count raised to the third power, the cube of count. In other words, we're doing some simple math a whole lot of times. So the time it takes to do this simple math is going to take CPU time. It's going to bog down our CPU. It's going to tax it. But if we're not doing that process, then there is a chance that we will begin that process. If we choose a value from 0 to 10,000, and that chance, that random selection, happens to be less than or equal to 1, then the tax to CPU boolean will become true. We will begin using our taxed uh, process. And also, because we don't want it to happen forever, we want to make our counter equal to our tax counter set. So in this algorithm here, there's two conditions, whether this Boolean is true or false. If we're taxing our CPU, we go through this meaningless mathematical process a whole lot, which will slow down our frame processing. If the tax CPU is false, then there is a small chance each frame that it will be turned on true. And this tax counter will be set to have the set value, which is 2,000. So it's our tax counter that is going to count down until it gets to zero, and then that's how the Boolean goes from being true to being false. So every time the Boolean flips on to be true, it's going to tax the CPU for two seconds because 
the tax counter is being reduced by timing. And the tax counter set, the amount of, of milliseconds that it's going to start at is 2,000, which is two seconds of time. Now, for all the interactions that are happening, we want the user to be able to see some of this. So in the draw objects, we're going to include a couple more print lines. I'm going to copy this. And what we're going to print, instead of frame, we're going to print frame, but we're going to print something else, is the timing. and then blit it. Copy these both in order to give the user a view of yet another thing. We have our frames per second, which we'll abbreviate FPS. That's an integer. Change the coordinates. And lastly, if if that boolean that's taxing the CPU is true, then we will do another render of a print line and another blit of it to see it. In this case, it will read the word processing. Which doesn't require any variables. Let's see if there are any errors. We have to give an initial value for tax CPU. And we have to make sure that it's consistent We can see now our animation, they're not in sync. We can see printed out that the value of timing is 1. And we have the processing done, but it's being blitted on top of the frames per second. So let's move the coordinates of that last blit, blit and look at our program. Timing is 1, that's very fast. The timing goes up when we're in the processing algorithm. The frames per second go down. The motion of the red ball is most affected when the CPU is taxed. The CPU is taxed when it says processing. The blue ball is moving consistently. Sometimes when the processing is intense, when the C taxed CPU boolean is true and it's in the process of doing that meaningless mathematical task and slowing down the frame loop and increasing the value of timing, and decreasing the frames per second, the blue ball does seem to be a little jittery. That's because sometimes when the processing is intense, there is a time at which the, there's more time at which it print it blitz or it draws the blue ball and then the next frame draws it at a substantial distance away from the last time so we can see it bumping along. But if we're able to track the progress of the blue ball's bounce, it would be consistent and um, based on real world time. Whereas the red ball is greatly affected.
by the CPU being slowed down. We want to base our animation on real world time all of the time that we code. It's a better way to go and more realistic. More importantly, your programs will work approximately the same when you put them on other computers. Now you. You've seen how to make a clock instance. Use it to find the time it takes to compose a frame. How to base animation on time and base an effect on a countdown. Make a simple program that displays two colored squares on a black screen. Use a clock. Have one square blink regularly on and off every second. So that means on for a second, off for a second, on for a second based on real world time. And the other square blink on and off every one and one half second. So they're both gonna blink based on real world time, but they're gonna be out of sync. Have fun.